China is a fascinating place. I implore everybody to come and see. Um, I may have said some negative things about it, but the positives outweigh the negatives. Yeah, we'll see what happens, especially this year. This is, we're here talking about China at a very pivotal point. Um, the 19th People's Congress in October will shape what China does for the next five years and probably how it affects the world in the next five years. It will have a big impact on gaming. Right? Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. So in the, in the Chinese mentality for games, right, and this is from a grander scale, not from a um, micro scale. So indies are completely not included in this, um, and some of the better developers aren't included in this. So when I talk about this from a, I th I'm talking about this from a macro level. When you think about game design in China, a lot of the games are designed for quick, quick play, pay to win, and for one-handed play. So when you're thinking about how they design a lot of the MMORPGs, they only require one hand. And the reason why they require one hand is so the player can smoke or do other things while he's playing. So um, you think about a uh, uh, MMORPG like Ragnarok Online or um, World of Warcraft. Yeah. You know how questing works, right? You're supposed to click, you go to this place, you meet this um, NPC, the NPC explains to you what to do, you click, click yes, then you go and you hunt and you kill. And when you're clicking, you're, you're clicking the monster to kill the monster, and you're using your, your other hand to do spells, your, um, your actions, and all that other stuff. Whereas in a Chinese MMO, especially the modern ones, um, I cl you click once on, this, on the little item on the text box. The text box will say, go to the XY location, click it. Your character will automatically run to the NPC, go through the whole dialogue. It, the dialogue is um, auto-forwarded. Auto then after that, it'll run towards the monsters, and it'll start hacking and slashing the monsters. Yeah. Um, the only thing you have to do is pick up loot, yeah. nothing else. This is something that um, a lot of people talk about, and it's because Chinese society as a whole is split between the extravagantly wealthy and then the really poor. There's, everybody talks about a middle class in China. Um, there is a middle class, it's just not the same way people in Europe or America or even the developed nations think of a middle class. The gap is very high. Um, you have a population of close to 1.4 billion, or if the official numbers are higher, 1.4 billion people, the people who are developed live in the cities. Um, Beijing has a population of around, they say 12 million, but reality is around 18 million, or 22 million. Shanghai is about the same. So these are mega cities, right? Of that population, half the people are making a decent living. The other half are making, um, they're making ends meet. I wouldn't say, I, want to, I don't want to disparage these lower economic people. It's an issue of they make a certain amount of money, so they spend their money on entertainment values that help them feel better about themselves. So when people say gaming is the opiate for the masses, gaming in China is definitely the opiate for the masses. So a lot of these young people who say work at a restaurant or work at a 7-Eleven, they don't make a lot of money, but they spend their money on a lot of it on gaming. And what do they spend it on gaming? They spend it on skins, they spend it on items, they spend it on abilities to show off their virtual life to everybody else in the country. So um, one example is there are games, right, where the amount of money you spend per month puts you the highest on the leaderboard. So people will spend somewhere between 10,000 RMB, which is equivalent to a lower entry level income, monthly income, on like a sword just spending that money just to buy a sword so they can show off and say, hey, I'm number one in this leaderboard to make themselves feel better about their lives. And it's not to say that their lives are terrible, it's just that the way society is right now, the haves have everything, the have-nots are struggling to have something. And therefore, to make themselves feel like they're the haves, they spend money on virtual goods.
there is a massive gaming culture in China. Um, I don't want to tie gaming culture in China to anime culture, but um, if you look at Chinese culture, Chinese culture, right, and the Chinese, the people who understand the culture, people who are in the business, will will understand it. They will say that um, there's a heavy Japanese influence. The government obviously hates the Japanese influence, but there are anime festivals. There's cosplay festivals in China, right? So this quote unquote. In Chinese, they call it Ertsu, and in Japanese, it's called Nijigen, which means living in the um, the two D world. Um, this is primarily for anime man and manga, um, not so much video games, but video games are a subsection of this. So you would say you would see a lot of peripherals. You will see like Bloodborne statues, League of Legends statues, plush toys, Pokemon, all that stuff. Um, China has been very heavily influenced by its neighbors, Korea, uh, Japan, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And Q culture is so prevalent in that area, that and anime culture is so prevalent in that area that it's here too. So as much as the Chinese government tries to censor or push away anime, kids are watching anime. Same thing with video games. As much as they try to censor video games, kids are playing video games. So when we go back to the people who are the 80s generation, the 90s generation who are playing video games, one of the reasons I think the Xbox is having trouble in China, next you know, well, one of the reasons why I think the Xbox and I think the PlayStation in, in, are having trouble in China is because a lot of the content that they bring in is heavily Western and not very um, Asian. So Nintendo does it very good well because it plays on nostalgia. Everybody growing up here knows Super Mario. Um, the games that Sony needs to bring in are the Final Fantasies. And when, when Final Fantasy came in for the Xbox and PlayStation in China, it did pretty well. People were, in terms of buzz, people were new about it, people weren't interested in it. Um, so you tie into what people are comfortable and people already know, which is Asian aesthetics, Asian culture, Asian games. Um, so when you think about game design, we're going back to, I'm, I'm circling a lot of topics right now. But when you circle back into game design, right, you'll notice in Chinese games, there's always going to be a Sun Wukong, Monkey King character. There's always going to be a Zhuge Liang, uh, General character. There's going to be a Zhang Fei, um, all these um, warring kingdoms, uh, Chinese exorcists. There's the, all these Chinese elements into it. Because Chinese people want to see elements of Asia culture in their games. So again, circling back now, we're talking about third-party peripherals like your, your collectibles, your toys, your books, your non-gaming stuff, right? Um, all the game shops will help sell these items because Chinese people are collectors, first and foremost. They want to show off their collection. They want to say they're like the top of whatever they're doing. So they would buy this stuff heavily. Um, and at the same time, this stuff is easier to show off than the games itself. Um, Truth be told, when you're showing off games and you're going to these um, third parties, these um, underground import stores, it's just massive like boxes. It's boxes like there's a giant uh, UPS box. You open it, 50, 50 copies of Bloodborne. So there's no space for them to show all the, all the games, right? So they show off the third party figures to tell people that, hey, I have this stuff. Maybe I have the game too. Um, or they're just showing off that they love the game, they're a gamer, they're a fan of the stuff, and the statues are just really cool to look at. That's also another reason. People just say, I like this because it looks really cool. Interesting tidbit. The guys who make all the collectibles for, uh, well, not all the collectibles, but some of the bigger and cooler Assassin's Creed statues are based in Shanghai. Yeah, former Ubisoft guys.
there's no such thing as a GameStop in China, hmm. or um, I don't know what the equivalent in Europe is, but I know there's a game in the UK. There's also a game in um, in Australia. I don't know what else is there. What other game stores there are in Europe, right? But there's GameStop game and all that. All these branded um, stores in China because of what happened in 2001. There was a there was so quote unquote the console ban. Um, the PlayStation had come out in China. Um, Xbox was planning to come out in China. This is the original fat dinner plate Xbox. And then the consoles were banned. Um, the idea was more or less along the lines of um, they're detrimental to health. All that all this different all the stuff that people say about the console ban is BS. The government just didn't know what they're doing. They decided to well, I wouldn't say they didn't know what they're they were it was more or less trying to protect the industry. So they decided to not allow console gaming in China. Um, so this quote unquote console ban was only for official sales. So what happened was people started bringing in stuff and selling it out of their own um, their own little shops. So now you have these what they call the gray market, import market. Um, so when people talk about there not being consoles in China, right? It's an official capacity. Now it's now they're officially here. Sony's officially here. Microsoft's officially here. Nintendo is here, but not here. Nintendo doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> they have a subsidiary called IQ. Yes, I know the IQ yeah. player. IQ, IQ is Nintendo is a wholly owned Nintendo subsidiary. Okay. Sony Computer Entertainment in China is a JV. Microsoft Xbox in China is a joint venture. Both of these are joint ventures. IQ Systems in China is a wholly owned subsidiary of Nintendo, okay. which begs, it's a story for a different time. Okay. But anyway, circling back to game consoles, right? Um, since there's still official stores, the big box stores, the Guomei, the, um, the Sunnings, they don't sell consoles. They didn't before 2014, 2015, because that's the official now. So all your official stores don't have consoles. People are selling them through gray market. So there are lots of game shops in China. Their, their game shops are located where the computer repair shops are because they're selling imported goods, um, imported hardware, all that stuff. So you'll find them. There's one actually, if you walk down from where we are right now yeah. um, to Beijing West Road okay. and take a right and walk about a block, there's a store that should have Logitech and PlayStation branding on the outside and it sells you for everything from a Nintendo Switch to a PlayStation 4 to an Xbox One. Um, how, they, how do they get their product is they usually buy from smugglers um, from Hong Kong or from Taipei or from Japan or from Singapore. Um, Microsoft, Xbox, Nintendo, they all sell their games in these markets, right? So you know how the regions are EU, um, US, AU, and um, there's sometimes Asia? So the Asia market is where the Chinese get their games. Um, before 2014, most games were either in English or Japanese. Recently now, they're going to be able to find games that have Chinese subtitles. So they're buying games from Hong Kong region. So if you actually look at the sales numbers of games in Hong Kong, it's much higher than the population of people in Hong Kong. <laughs> and why? Because all the games are being, all the units are being sold in China on the gray market. What?
so when you talk about long form games, right, like console games, like games like The Last, the Last of Us, right, um, or Uncharted, or um, like The Last Halo, I have to I have to give a Microsoft plug because I'm a Microsoft person, or I, 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 yeah. um, or even Zelda, right, um, the Breath of the Wild guys, these would be the hardcore console gamers who have had some money, who were able to follow the console's generations as they grew up. Um, most Chinese gamers, and I would say most, because there's, again, so many people in China, right? The console population is very small. Um, not to give away any confidential numbers, but I would say you would probably have around 12 million people who are console gamers, um, but they aren't hardcore. Your hardcore number would probably be much like half of that. This is just, I'm just throwing numbers out there. These are not official numbers. These are not, uh, okay. <laughs> these are, I'm just throwing, I'm just giving a, a best guesstimate for this. Um, so the, the console number, there's a lot of people who have consoles, the hardcore guys, but they're a very small number. Now, I, no, not very small, they're still a sizable number compared to like everywhere else in the world. Uh, they would still make an impact on sales. Um, so this small number of hardcore guys would be buying your Last of Us, will be playing Breath of the Wild, will be playing Halo 5. But the majority of players will be playing your online games. They'll be playing your MMORPGs, they'll be playing your Counter-Strikes, your League of Legends, your Dota 2s, your, um, what else? What, um, your, they'll be playing your mobile games. And one of the biggest mobile games right now that takes up a lot of time is um, Arena of Heroes, or um, I, I don't know what it's called. It's called something different in every region. It's not a Yin Yang Shi. No, okay. Yin Yang Shi is the Netties uh, Omiyanaji game, which okay. you're playing as um, a what's it called? Um, an exorcist. Okay. Yeah. So which summon monsters? The, it's a card game, right? I'm talking about the Tencent built, or the, ten, the Tencent published, Teamy built game, okay. um, which is basically League of Legends on your phone. Um, it's, I have it on my phone, but since my phone's not working, I can't show it to you. Um, unfortunately, my iPhone has touch disease. Um, this game now is a League of Legends match, like an actual full-on MOBA game, that lasts anywhere from 25 minutes to 45 minutes per match, and it's built very well. Um, it's literally taking the League experience on a mobile scale. So when you're talking about long-form game entertainment, the average Chinese gamer will play long form as well, but they'll be playing multiplayer long form. Single player long form games tend to be more geared towards the console games. Um, there's some single player games on the market, but if you go to any net cafe in China, when you open up this, uh, the system, most of the games you'll see are going to be multiplayer games. Um, there is a desire subconsciously and socially for people to connect because everything's so far apart, they're working all the time. Um, people want to connect with other people. Now they're doing it through digital spaces. Um, but when you talk about long form gaming, especially modern mobile gaming, people will be playing mobile games on the subway, one-handed Candy Crush, or the Candy Crush um, copy or fake out there is, some kind of um, side-scrolling, some kind of platforming game. And then they'll sit down and play Honor Val Valor or whatever they're call it's called now. Um, and they'll even come, like I was in Starbucks a month ago and I was sitting at that table over there and a group of five young men came in on their lunch break and just sat down and started playing with each other on, uh, well, on that game, playing that game. So to say that there's a quintessential Chinese player, um, I would say there really isn't. There's lots of different Chinese players. Um, so we talked about earlier about game design being built for one hand. That's for the, I would say, the slightly lazier and more low-end Chinese player who spends their time in an internet cafe. The guys who spend a lot of money on, they want to show off, that's another level. And there's lots of rich guys who spend a lot of money just to show off too. That's another level of Chinese player. Then there's the ones who want to have a social experience. And then there's the ones who just play on their phone. Yeah.
when we were talking about this on the way in, we were talking about uh, bootleg consoles, right? So when La, La TV, right, tried to announce their little fuse box last year, and you've probably seen the story, Brian wrote it on Kotaku. Um, the fuse box, one of the games that would launched on the fuse box was a Dynasty Warriors game. Okay. So one of the games that launched on, um, or one of the games that they tried to push on Xbox in China, one of the games that they tried to launch with PlayStation in China was Dynasty Warriors. Um, so games with Chinese elements and Chinese history elements are incredibly popular. Now when we talk about games built by Chinese people, there are quite a few. I can't name any big ones off the top of my head, but early on a lot of them actually came from Taiwan and Hong Kong. So, and they're not exactly based on Chinese history. They're based on um, Chinese wuxia culture. And wuxia culture is uh, martial arts fantasy, right? Um, lots of these movies are around. Um, they're the Chinese guys with the long hair, the beautiful faces, the women with the long, um, with like the tight shirts, um, the long flowing dresses. Everyone's, everyone's wearing a robe, carrying a sword. Um, they're all based on, they're all some acts, some, level related to the wuxia genre, right? And when I talk about wuxia, I talk about like things like Jing Yong, the Hong Kong writer who wrote, um, uh, I can't remember the titles now. But yeah, it's, it's um, Smiling Wonder, um, something with Deer Cauldron, all these, these are all fantasy novel stories about um, fighting dynasties, um, martial arts sects, like the Wu-Tang, the actual Wu-Tang clan from Wu-Tang Mountain fighting the Ermei sect or Shaolin Temple and the Shaolin Monks. Um, this is all the stuff that the Wu-Tang Clan rap, raps about that's not violence, money, or anything um, America-related. Because, I mean, Enter the, when you think about Enter the 36 Chambers, right, that's a quintessential Wuxia movie, or a concept, despite the fact that it's a martial arts movie, more so than anything else. So, Chinese people and Chinese gamers play a lot of, played a lot of Wuxia online games. Um, so one of the big one of the big ones came, is I think Smiling Night. I don't remember the exact translation, but it's available on Xbox now. They remade it for China, and it's in Xbox in China online in um, on the Xbox Store. So this game came out of Taiwan. Some of the other games came out of Hong Kong. So they built these things in Hong Kong, Hong Kong and Taiwan in the 80s, early 90s, late 90s, early 90s, that area. And Chinese people played them online in net cafes here, and they're incredibly popular. Um, you look at cosplay. People cosplay as these characters. Um, I know a couple who got married dressed as these characters. I gotta find the pictures. If I can find the pictures, I'll send it to you. Um, I would love it. Yeah. So, um, this aspect and this element of um, gaming is very prevalent in Chinese culture. Um, they love this stuff. So, when you're circling back and talking about how these people are, or the Chinese are, how, they, how do they feel about Japanese people making these stuff, right? Japan has a big culture on the Three Kingdoms too, because the stories coded them as well. So they know it as well, Taiwan knows it. It's a shared cultural uh, phenomenon. So they don't really care, because the games are good, it tells the stories that they like, and it's history and gives them something to identify with. So I, I interview a lot of developers, I have dinner and I hang out with a lot of these guys. Um, to say that there's a Chinese way of developing, I would say it's, development is pretty much the same everywhere. It's just a different level of what kind of management process they go through. Do they go through Scrum? Do they go through Agile? How do they, um, how do they manage the team? How, how fast do they build? Um, so early on in the 90s and the early 2000s, right, China was, and it still is, the factory of the world. So foreign companies like EA, 2K, Ubisoft, um, Konami, all have offices in Shanghai right now. And why do they have offices in Shanghai? The reason was because it was an outsourcing hub. They came here to outsource development. It was cheaper, the talent was here, they were educated, they knew how to code, they're very quick. Um, it's a factory mentality. So in terms of indies, I don't know how they do it in the sense because they don't they obviously they're obviously not a factory, but they do it's development. So I wouldn't say there's a special development way they do it.
So when we talk about indie games in China, right, we have to go a bit further back. Um, when people talk about China from a social, a st social standpoint, they talk about the post 70s generation, the post 80s generation, the post 90s, the post 2000s, right? So this refers to young people. Um, I'm from the post 80s. The current people entering the, the workforce now are from the 2000s, the so called millennials, right? Um, so the indie designers, when we talk about these guys, these guys tend to be from the post 80s. A lot of them are from the post 90s. Some of them are from the post 70s. And this is the first generation of Chinese to actually interact with modern computer gaming. Um, so when we're in America, when we're in Europe, we think of gaming starting with Atari, starting with Pong and all that stuff, right? Um, Magnavox, ColecoVision, um, Magnavision, all that stuff. When you think about gaming in Asia, the, the obvious name is Nintendo. So the Chinese got involved, or Nintendo was not officially in China. It never has been. They manufacture here. Um, they are officially in China now, but that's, that's a different story later on. Um, so Nintendo wasn't here officially. So these, what the, a lot of the Chinese businessmen, and when we think about the Chinese, China in the 80s, we don't think about, we think about China as communist, closed, we think about some of the more, more negative aspects of what happened during the 80s. But what happened in the 80s and 90s was people were leaving China to go work outside, to do business, to study. And some of the parents at that time came back to China with their kids, or for their kids, with Famicoms. They got them from Japan, they got them from America. So Nintendo, they, got, they came with Nintendos. And the Chinese called these red and white machines. So they would play Nintendo games. Um, and so a lot of my Chinese friends who grew up here would talk about living in the small uh, villages or neighborhoods, right? And somebody would come home and say, oh my god, I have a Nintendo. So all the kids would run to their house in the little hutongs or the little lane houses, and they sit there and watch the kids play either Super Mario, well, it would be Mario, it would be um, Bomberman, or whatever game they were playing. So they were playing these very simple games. So the people who have a very deep passion about video games are usually, usually came from this era of the 1980s, 1990s. And so when you talk about these indie developers in China, it's like any developer everywhere. Um, they have this passion, this love for video games in general, and they want to create their own. They want to show that they, their, their creations are a love letter to video games themselves. And so the Chinese indie developers, they're growing by the numbers. Um, if you go, I remember being in Beijing in 2011, and I went to my first game jam in Beijing. There was somewhere between 20 teams. The next year it became 30 teams. Um, this year somewhere between 80 teams, and they had to split game jams across Beijing, Wuhan, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Chongqing. So they had like five different cities in China. Um, and these developers aren't making games that are fast cash grabs or clones of something else. They're trying to make things their own. They're trying to show that, and they have this chip on their shoulder. They're trying to show that everybody knows China for being the world of copycats. It's the world of fake iPhones, um, counterfeit League of Legends, um, fake iWatches, all that stuff, right? But these guys realize this and they're like, but they've been in China all their lives, they have this kind of patriotism that doesn't border on nationalism, it's more along the lines of, I love my country, I love my culture, I love video games. How do I create something that shows the world I love video games and I am completely different from everything you know? And so they're creating these games. So um, this past March, I was in PAX East and I bought a group of Chinese developers to show off their games. And the reception in the U.S. was great. Some of these guys didn't even know the games that we were showing was made in China. Um, one game is Home Behind, or not Home Behind, it's, um, I can't remember the name now. It's a music game, it's an indie game, it's a music game. Um, Brandy was there and everybody was like, oh my god, this music, this game has so much feels, I love it. It's, oh, it's coming to iPad, so they were happy about it. Then um, another friend of mine was showing off his game, uh, Hidden Dragon Legend. And now that they're in PAX West, it was all on uh, Twitch. And they're looking at this game is amazing. It's the coolest uh, uh, side-scrolling uh, action game. And then they were showing off Icy, which was a, um, a Mega Man X-inspired uh, platformer as well. And that went very well. That actually got picked up by Sony to launch as a PlayStation exclusive on Sony Chinese indie games. So the indie guys are doing things that are not expected of Chinese developers to begin with. And they're drawing the attention of big shots everywhere in the world.